welcome to the first distinguished speaker seminar of this semester. We have the pleasure to have Gary Marcus. Uh, he is an advocate of near symbolic AI for more than three decades. Uh, he was a student of Steven Pinker and got a PhD from MIT at just 23 years old. And not so many people can say that. And he was professor at NYU for more than two decades. He's author of many books, uh, for example, The Algebra of Mind, 2001, and the most recent one that is related to AI in 2019 with Ernie Davis, Re Rebooting AI. And he has written for many journals and is uh, all the time mentioned by the media. And also he's very active on social media uh, against the hype of AI. So please, Gary, uh, we are glad that you are talking about the Proper Foundation for AGI. Thank you for coming. Oops. Uh, thanks very much for having me. Um, <coughs> um, so as, as you say, I'm going to talk about foundations for AI. Um, I often give this talk lately to the small number of people that are on my side, uh, which is neurosymbolic AI. And even for them, I have, oh, um, I recognize a lot of friendly names in the room. So folks, um, a lot of what I'm going to talk about today is drawn on work that I've done with Ernie Davis for the last decade or so. Um, some of which is in our book, uh, Rebooting AI, and in an article that I'll be particularly drawing on today called, Has AI Found a New Foundation? So I, I want to give a shout out to Ernie Davis. Um, there is a growing anti-Gary Marcus there. Um, uh, there have been many, many things uh, uh, against me by Kuhn and, and Slate Star Codex and so on and on. Um, and it, it's a common rhetorical move to say it's only me, but there's actually lots of people that believe the things that I will tell you today. Um, and in fact, most of the things that I've said have been with Ernie Davis and uh, credit and blame uh, get shared. Um, so uh, I, I've often recently imagined myself at a protest march, except instead of asking for social justice, um, in the, answers the questions to what do we need? When do we want it? and so forth. I imagine that what do we need is artificial and general intelligence. And some people might actually want it now, although that's controversial and we could talk about whether we want it or not at all. Um, and I think it's also ask, worth asking another question about artificial general intelligence or AI that I think is more robust maybe than we have now, which is why don't we have been working on it for so long? And so I'll talk about that as well. Some people already think we're close to AGI. Elon Musk, for example, um, is often, I think, hyping AI. I think that's part of his shtick. Um, so in May, for example, he wrote to Jack Dorsey, the one who was for a while the CEO of Twitter. Um, and he says, 2029 feels like a pivotal year. I'd be surprised if we don't have AGI by then. Hopefully people on Mars too. Um, I don't know much about Mars. Um, I will say that if we get anybody on Mars by 2029, I'm pretty sure it'll be a one-way ticket. We won't have solved the problem of getting people back from Mars. But in any case, um, I do know something about AI, and I think it's very implausible that we have general intelligence um, in the sense of being kind of flexible and adaptive like human beings by the year 2029. So on a place called garymarcus.substack.com, where I've been blogging for the last couple of months, um, I... Musk bet. I said, um, and this was again really work with Ernie Davis, although the money was mine. I, I put up $100,000. Other people quickly matched me to half a million dollars, betting we wouldn't have AGI by 2029. And I gave some criteria. So I said, we wouldn't by then be able to watch have an AI that could watch a movie, tell you accurately what's going on, um, which actually dates back to something I proposed in New Yorker in 2014 that we wouldn't be able to read a novel reliably, answer questions about plot and character and, and motivations. And um, I recommended Steve Wozniak's uh, benchmark, which is you should be able to go into anybody's home and figure out how to make coffee. You could imagine other kinds of things like that. And then some benchmarks around computer programming and mathematics and so forth. And a key point about general intelligence is you shouldn't just solve one of these things. We've been pretty good at solving certain narrow domain problems, though not all of them. Um, like Go and protein folding, but we've been very poor at, at general AI. And so, you know, in order to say that we did succeed at a general AI, um, I thought you should be able to do at least three out of five of these things. Um, Elon Musk, standing behind his words, said, sure, half a minute. Elon Musk uh, did not respond, um, did not put money behind his mouth. Um, his, Elon, his response so far is this, and somebody mid-journey captured it nicely. Um, uh, this relates to uh, Optimus on Friday, if you get the joke, but anyway. All right. Um, there are other people that, that are um, 
uh, also kind of in positions of power in AI, who would like to think that it's going to be really here soon. So Sam Altman, who's the CEO of OpenAI, said in five years, he said this a year ago, we'll have computer programs that can think, read legal documents, and give medical advice. Um, I'm actually doing some research on the history of Watson, and that's, of course, Watson was promised to do that and didn't come anywhere near close to actually thinks that, that Sam Altman's proposal uh, here is actually plausible. What do we actually have now? Well, almost all the talk in AI these days is about uh, <coughs> foundation models is, is the buzzword. There was a huge paper about this by like, I don't know, 80 or 100 authors uh, last summer, about a year ago, um, um, all affiliated with this new research on foundation models at Stanford. And what do they really mean by this? So this is where I think almost all the effort in AI these days goes to like 90 or 80%. Um, so foundation models um, have been pretty, become pretty familiar through the, for almost everybody. These are models like GPT-3 and DALI that are trained on huge amounts of data at scale. And then they get adapted to some kind of downstream tasks. Um, another name for them might be large pre-trained language models. And what language model really means here is there a model of what words people say next in a sentence? So if you think about autocomplete, um, say when you're texting on your phone, these are basically forms of autocomplete. They get a lot of language and then they're able to predict what a person might say next um, in the example on the left, which is from GPT-3. So you might type in some sentences and then the system might generate some very plausible English prose afterwards. Or now we have systems that you type in a set of words and, and they'll maybe make a, make a picture for you. Um, this is really most of what people talk about in AI these days. And a question you can ask is, is something like this, a large neural network model trained on a bunch of sentences, really a good foundation for AI? Well, let's talk about the word foundation. <coughs> foundation is basically the bedrock on which a larger structure is built. Above all else, what, what is a foundation being about? A foundation is about being reliable. The whole point of a foundation of a house is that it, you can trust it. Um, large neural network models like GPT-3 and, and BIRD and DALI and so forth, but reliability is really not one of them. So I've been trying to point this out for a few years. Um, one example was in a paper that did not get the name it was supposed to get um, in technology review. It was supposed to be called <coughs> GPT-3 Bullshit Artist. Our editor made us pull punches, um, but you, you and I can all know that that's what it was supposed to be called. And we gave examples like this. So the top part is what we typed into GPT-3. Um, maybe I'll let people read that for themselves or I get a drink of water here. Um, so you have this scenario about cranberry juice and grape juice and Ernie Davis actually wrote it. Um, and the point was, see whether the system really understood the concepts of things like cranberry and grape juice, or whether it just statistically noticed sentences like, um, you can't smell anything, you sniffed it, you're thirsty. And really the, what the answer we got was, was driven by the statistics. Um, also the statistics that in the corpuses on Reddit and so forth that it's trained on, death is a common theme as it turns out. Um, and so the, the system says you drink this cran grape juice essentially, what happens? And, or sorry, you, you have this stuff, the system correctly predicts that you drink it, and then it says incorrectly, you're now dead. Nobody's going to die from drinking a little mixture of cranberry and grape juice. The system has fundamentally confounded the statistical situation about what words might follow one another, because that's really what a large language model models, um, with having a model of the world, which you have. There are many, many examples like this. Um, and lots of problems with it. These systems are very prone to spreading misinformation. They don't actually understand how the world works. So <clears throat> you might have some random person on Reddit saying Bill Gates invented COVID-19, which is of course completely untrue, but a system like Replica, which is built on GPT-3, will also tell you that the COVID vaccine is not very effective and so forth. Here's another example from a, a French company called Nabla that was investigating whether GPT-3 could be turned into a medical chatbot. <clears throat> so human types in, hey, I feel very bad. I want to kill myself. And GPT-3 gives a great answer. I'm sorry to hear that. I can help you with that. But its depth of understanding is really minimal because then the person says, should I kill myself? And the system says, I think you should. Well, no suicide 
uh, counselor should be saying that. I mean, you could talk about euthanasia and so forth, but you should not have somebody walking in the room and you tell them to commit suicide. Um, but the system doesn't actually understand concepts about death or suicide or anything else. It's just predicting next words. It turns out that if you look in training corpuses and people say, should I blank? Um, often human beings say, I think you should. People are supportive of their friends' actions and so forth. This is a case where you shouldn't. The system has no idea. Um, another example from the linguist Alice Neniger, um, took one of these models and said, a robin is a blank, right? They fill in the next word in the sentence. And the system said, a robin is a bird. That's a perfectly reasonable answer. And then she tried something fiendish. She said, a robin is not. Well, it turns out these systems have no idea what words like not actually mean. A robin is not a bird. Well, that's a crazy answer. And in general, <coughs> it has turned out that for years and years, systems like this um, are very, here's a even more uh, frightening, in some ways, um, you have a system uh, that is automatically extracting, I don't know if it uses a large language model or not, but automatically extracting text and it says what to do in this seizure and it extracted everything from the text out there except the words do not. And so the advice for a seizure was actually 100% wrong. Then people have tried adapting these systems to moral reasoning. <clears throat> Again, using the statistics of language, in this case, the language was actually tailored to morality um, is a problem. So this system, somebody said, should I commit genocide if it makes everybody happy? Well, the co statistical correlative, if it makes everybody happy in this system was a kind of positive rating. So it said, you should. Well, this was not actually good advice. Um, maybe I'll skip that one. I think I've made enough of that point already. There are other problems, um, for example, sexism. Uh, here's an example from, that somebody else gave me that I posted on, on the web of Polish to English. So you have something where the definite article, I won't try to pronounce the Polish, but the definite article in every sentence is identical. And the truth is back, she is beautiful, he is clever, he reads, she washes the dishes, and so forth. It's about as sexist as you could possibly imagine, because all that's getting spit back is the statistics of a corpus, and not anything about what it might be saying. And then, you know, on Twitter, uh, challenge almost everything I say, but in this, this time when I came back with, yeah, that I find the same thing in my language when I do the translation. Um, there was a, I think, lovely head, headline, I should say 2021, um, uh, from the next web by, I think, Tristan uh, Harris, is, no, Tristan uh, Green, excuse me, um, saying, uh, DeepMind tells Google it has no idea how to make AI less less toxic. People in the field now realize that these large language models do all these problematic things, but nobody really has anything to do with it, has anything to do about it. And I think that's because fundamentally predicting statistical words has nothing to do with having concepts about the world. You need a whole different framework with concepts about the world <coughs> to actually make progress on problems like these. Well, um, I'll skip this one for now, except to say that misinformation is a very serious problem and it's proven much harder to solve than people think. There is a parody by the cartoon XKCD that I think actually really catches what's going on right now. Right now, what people are doing are taking big piles of linear out, basically what deep learning is, and there's no methodology here. They try things, if they work, they publish them. If they don't, then like in this cartoon, they just stir the pile until things are looking right. But we don't have a systematic uh, way of doing this and just adding more data and so forth um, is not really helping uh, helping these systems. They continue to make the most ridiculous kinds of errors. Like you say, Sally's favorite cow died <coughs> yesterday. When will the cow be alive again? And the system says in a few days. It just doesn't understand the difference between being alive and dead. And then a cult in, in the field where people try things, like they add a few words, they find that um, if you say, well, let's take things step by step, sometimes the systems work better. So then you try that in an example like this, you say, Sally's favorite cow died yesterday, when will the cow be alive again? Let's take this step by step. And the system then takes things step by step and it gives you a whole bunch of intermediate steps. Like um, uh, it, it takes 90 days of gestation for a cow to give birth to another cow. Um, and then you come out with the answer to, um, when will the cow be alive again? And you get 90 days, which is absurd. The fundamental reality is that contemporary AI basically has a long tail problem. It's really good if you have big data, lots of data about routine things, and it's really 
unusual but important things, or um, what I jokingly. This is um, fundamentally what's going on. There is a kind of myth out there that you just put in more and more data, you have more compute, and out comes artificial general intelligence. But that never really solves the long tail problem. There's still always outliers, no matter how much data that you add. So I, I think this is silly, although it's pretty much the predominant view in the field. There are people making t-shirts saying scale is all you need, trying to show that if you have enough data, it will project out. But in fact, things like telling the truth and understanding the world are not scaling as fast as other things like sounding fluent. So the metaphor I've been using for a decade in which Jan LeCun happened to use the other day um, is that deep learning is a better ladder, but a better ladder doesn't necessarily get you to the moon. What would be better? Well, I think to get further, we're really almost gonna have to start over. We're gonna need to build a deeper AI. Right now, deep learning is, you know, it sounds deep, but really deep just means a number of layers in a neural network. It doesn't mean conceptual depth. <clears throat> we're going to need to get to conceptual depth if we're going to get to trustworthy AI. So this is essentially the argument of the book, Rebooting AI. And then there's an archive article I have online for free, which <clears throat> develops some of the ideas there. Um, and it'll kind of guide the next part of the talk if you want to read afterwards. So a first point to make, it's sort of obvious to people who really do this for a living, but not for people outside of AI, is that AI is not actually one technique, but many. Deep learning is a kind of machine learning, and machine learning is one of many things that people do in artificial intelligence. Often, if they want to do something successful, they have to actually combine these things. So for example, AlphaFold 2 is probably the biggest contribution to AI so far, it um, automatically folds proteins. It's not perfect. We could talk about its limitations, but it's really an amazing uh, tool for, for biology. And it works by combining a very classical technique in search called Monte Carlo tree search with a deep learning technique. Um, <clears throat> and then a lot of knowledge representation as well about what, what proteins actually are and, and so forth. So the first thing that I've been calling for is a hybrid neurosymbolic approach meaning that we need to take some things from the neural network community, particularly its emphasis on learning, and some things from classical AI with its emphasis on symbolic abstract knowledge that can be generalized um, through algebraic-like operations over variables. Um, the reality is we are not getting to AI we can trust by relying on deep learning alone. All the examples that I showed you in the first part, how deep learning is not only failing and you know, occasionally making mistakes, but making the same kinds of mistakes over and over again for decades. Um, a realistic appraisal would be that it's good for learning, but it's poor for abstraction. I've been saying this for a long time. I've gotten an enormous amount of flack from the deep learning community for it, but now you can see like people like Yashua Bengio are starting their talks in this describes it um, in Kahneman's terms. He says, you know, deep learning has been good at system one. Now we need to figure out how to do system two. Um, and this is very similar point to the one that I'm making. Classical AI is not going to get us to robust AI either. It's very good at abstraction, but although there are some techniques like ILP, um, they're not in general as powerful at learning as, as deep learning is. And so it seems to me obvious, in fact, <clears throat> that what we really need are hybrid models that bring together the two traditions. And I think you see that a lot of major figures that have been hostile to this are in their own way trying to find a, a way of at least getting the the um, the virtues of both of sides of this equation. So Jürgen Schmidt Huber is one of the biggest uh, <coughs> people in deep learning, has a company he's been working on for the last several years. I talked to him about it the other day, and it's very much a neurosymbolic system that has explicit symbolic stuff working alongside of deep learning. Um, I had an interesting conversation with Gal McCoon over, over uh, Twitter in the last few days, but there's a ways in which he too is starting to see the wisdom of this. Um, what I've always said, although Kuhn usually gets this wrong, um, is that we don't need to toss deep learning. It's easy to character me by saying that what I'm saying is we should get rid of deep learning. And Lacoon has done that as recently as yesterday, despite being corrected. Um, but the reality is that I've always basically made the same point. Um, here's a good 18. Despite all of the problems that I've sketched, I don't think we need to abandon deep learning. Rather, what we need to do is to reconceptualize it, not as a universal solvent, but simply as one tool among many. So deep learning is really good at perception. But if you think about what cognition is as a whole, there are many components. This is a very crude caricature, but 
it's not unreasonable to kind of start here. There's perception, deep learning, things like common sense, planning, analogy, language, and reasoning. And I would argue that deep learning has done all of those things poorly. And that it is a mistake to assume that because you can do one piece of this pie with a particular technique that you can do all of them. But I think essentially that the way that most of the field thinks right now is exactly that. They think that if we just scale up what we're doing, we'll get the rest of these. Lacoon has a slightly different take we could discuss uh, in the discussion. He agrees with me that adding more data is not enough. Um, but I, I do think he thinks that deep learning is gonna handle all of these and I'm skeptical. Um, here's some interesting neurosymbolic work people might wanna go have a look at from AI21 Labs, which is a startup uh, with investment from Amnon Shafshua, who uh, worked on Mobileye, among other things. Um, <clears throat> what they're trying to do is to take large language models and integrate them with symbolic knowledge. And they're finding that in some fairly important ways, they do <coughs> much better than pure deep learning approaches. So one example is if you ask a neural network, who is the president um, right now, <coughs> a deep learning system is going to look at all the data. And across all the data, there's going to be a lot of data that says, is the president. And it can't reason over the fact that because someone was president doesn't mean that they still are and that else becomes president than the other person is not. Um, I guess you could argue that Donald Trump is a little like a deep learning system, but that would be a story for another day. Um, reality is that we do temporal reasoning over time. And this neurosymbolic system is trying to do a little bit of that, taking the model as a piece of it, but also having some classical symbolic AI. Uh, to keep things straight. I just got a, your internet connection is unstable, but hopefully we'll be okay here. Um, in my view, the Achilles traditional neural networks is what people might nowadays call uh, distribution shift and what I called in 1998, um, generalizing outside of a set of examples. So suppose you have to learn a trivially easy function of the input is the same as the output, f of x equals x, we call it the identity function you want a bunch of binary numbers that are the green ones here, you can generalize to some others that are nearby with a very simple neural network solution. But if you try to generalize to other numbers, they're out of the training space. Let's say odd numbers, they're outside the training space because they have a one in the rightmost digit and you've only been trained on even numbers, which don't. Um, these neural networks fail over and over and over again. In my view, this is the problem that has haunted essentially all efforts at getting neural networks to reason well or <clears throat> to use language well. I think it continues to be the problem. And this is in some sense, the strongest motivation for including symbol systems, which have no trouble at all with this kind of generalization. Um, I made these arguments back here in 1998, 2001, um, but the same kind of thing is still showing up. So here's a a working paper uh, from earlier this year from Yasmin Rezeji and Samir Singh. And what they did is they looked at arithmetic in a large language model. And what they found is the system is much more likely to get things right if they're highly frequent and much less likely to get things right if they're not frequent. Well, if you're doing, and here they're working with multiplication, I said, should have said that. If you're working with something like multiplication, you want a linear to all possible instances of a problem, not something that generalizes if it's in the distribution of cases that you have seen before and not if it's outside that distribution. And what they're finding is you get outside that distribution, it's problematic. Since this came out, a larger language model came, um, appeared Minerva and Minerva actually showed the same thing. Like it was okay at two digit multiplication problems, but at multiplying two four digit multiplication uh, things, it was basically, generalization was basically zero. Let's get that. Um, I think it's kind of a good exercise in perspective taking, especially for the, us old timers to think about the fact that in 1994, Intel recalled the Pentium chip and it was a huge scandal. It cost the company half a billion dollars, which is a lot of money for a company at that point. And everybody was really upset that the Pentium chip inside their Windows machine <coughs> made mistakes. But how often did it make mistakes? It made mistakes on an integer arithmetic, which I was just talking about, 0% of the time you know, on very, very rare floating point arithmetic problems that ever made a mistake. And they actually recalled the chip just because it once in a while made a mistake. Whereas GPT-3, you can train it with hundred billion parameters and it's still only 80% correct on three digit addition. They don't do division at all. They don't test floating point arithmetic and it's available now and there's billions of dollars. To me, this is an enormous step backwards.
we've seen systems like Dolly. I can maybe take questions about it. I, I think I have a little bit here and I can talk more about it if you like. Um, Dolly was kind of billed as this system that understands natural language and it can draw great images from natural language sometimes. But if you dive deeper, it doesn't, for example, understand the difference between a red cube, cube. If you give it words to repeat, it tends to make errors. Um, I won't go into all of the details here, but um, the thing on the left was someone at OpenAI trying to ridicule my notion that deep learning is hitting all they sort of got it right with their system and they sort of didn't. Um, the reality is that they're very systematic problems. I, I have an article about this in my garymarcus.substack.com the other day, which I didn't get to add into the slide, but I found that these systems systematically can't uh, correctly depict things like um, draw a bicycle and uh, circle the parts uh, that you pedal or uh, they don't understand things like function. They don't really even understand parts and whole. So it is true that if you give a very large database, do interesting things with them. But it's also true that they really don't, which they certainly fail on what I would call compositionality. They don't understand parts and holes um, and they don't understand function. You can't get the general intelligence if you don't understand basic concepts like that. Okay, second thing that I think you need besides a neurosymbolic hybrid, which to me seems like an absolute minimum <coughs> necessary requirement if we're going to make progress. We need to have a lot of knowledge. So human beings know things like if you break a bottle and there's some liquid in it, some of that liquid's probably going to escape. If you feed this into neural networks, you get very probabilistic stuff. Um, if you say, if you break a glass bottle that has toy soldiers, it might say the toy soldiers will probably follow you in there, which is just incoherent. Current systems just don't have concepts of things like bottle and soldier, and they don't have knowledge about how the everyday world works. And to me, it seems like foolish to even imagine that we might be close to general intelligence without a solution to that problem. <clears throat> I think probably, and I don't know if Iris Bayron is here. I didn't see her in the list as she arrived, but your colleague at Northeastern, Iris Bayron, has done very interesting work around this, showing that human beings have an innate resistance to believing that things are innate, essentially. But Elizabeth, and I think Iris is absolutely right. It's in the field, it's quite problematic. Actually, Iris and I have an article uh, coming out about this. Um, but if you look at the empirical literature, it's pretty clear that human children have some innate understanding of the world. And Liz Belke has argued that it has to be that way. Um, if children are in now, in now, endowed innately with abilities to perceive objects, persons, sets, and places, well, that's great. Then they can use their perceptual experience to learn about the properties and behaviors of such entities. If you don't start by having at least a kind of minimal ontology of the world, it's just not clear what you can learn from that point. And I think that the failures of massive, massive, massive uh, <coughs> large language models to really understand the world around them, like I documented in the first part of the talk, speaks to that. You, know, you have all of this data, but the systems don't really know how to organize that into a conception of the world. Um, I think we need at least a little bit of innate knowledge in order to be able to do that. Um, a simple example of like how far we really are away is a cheese grater. We know how to take a photograph and represent it as a set of bits. We can make a 3D model of a cheese grater, but what we don't is to have a system understand why you would run the cheese as another in order to get small bits of cheese out of it. Like if we're gonna to move to general intelligence, we need to be able to understand how the function of something relates to its form. And we, we just really are nowhere on that. Um, I'll skip that, I guess, in the interest of timing, leaving some time for discussion. I will point out that um, there's this kind of media hype around deep learning Deep, the media, for whatever reason, loves the deep learning narrative. It loves the narrative that AI is imminent. You can look, for example, at Kevin Roos's article in the New York Times um, a few weeks ago. But the reality is, for example, that deep learning isn't even always the best tool for current problems. So uh, Facebook, now Meta had something called the NetHack competition, where they took a game where you have a different dungeon every time. And symbolic AI crushed deep learning in this competition. And this is put on by... Facebook, which is pretty pro deep learning, but deep learning still lost in this because the system has no real knowledge of what's going on. And what deep learning tends to do is superficial, sort of like if I'm playing, will at this time 
um, be a brick. And so paddle to right here. Um, in this game, the dungeon is what we call procedurally generated. It's different every time you play the game. And that puts deep learning in real um, problematic space. Whereas if you have some abstract understanding of what rooms are in a dungeon and so forth, you do a lot better. You will not see that in the writings in the New York Times. Um, another thing that I think is critical is really two things I'm consolidating here, but are reasoning and cognitive models. And so uh, the, one of the people who's thought most deeply about this is Doug Lennett, who's built a system called Psych. Um, nowadays, I find people aren't that much aware of it. People used to be very aware of it in, in the AI space. Um, what Lennett tried to do is to systematize common sense in machine interpretable form with a system called Psych, which he's still working on, has been working on for decades. Um, and in an interesting article in Forbes in July 2019, he shows how at least in principle, systems like that can make spectacular in, uh, inferences, like doing the kind of reading comprehension that I suggested um, Elon Musk is not going to be able to solve by 2029. Um, so here, I won't go into all the details, but you can find the article in Forbes. He showed how a system like this was able to make inferences about what Romeo was thinking about Juliet when she was taking the death potion or what Juliet... The question was, um, when she takes the uh, feigned death potion, Juliet believes that... that uh, uh, does Juliet believe that Romeo will believe um, she is alive um, uh, or in suspension. And there's no current AI, other AI system aside from the symbolic system with a lot of common sense that can even come close to making like that, where it, what one person's knowledge of another person's knowledge relative to what they know. And yet, like that all the time, constantly reasoning about what other people might believe. We know that four-year-olds, though maybe not three-year-olds, are able to do that. And most of the world's movies depend on that. A lot of politics and diplomacy depend on that kind of thing. In order to actually do this stuff, you need cognitive models. What is going on in the world? Who believes what? You need to be able to reason over that. It's just not enough work on that in AI right now. And for that reason, it seems to me like anybody who's worried about artificial general intelligence being here in the next decade is not in touch with the realities of what actually would need to be done. Um, this again ties in with misinformation. So if you type the into the latest version of GPT-3, which is called, um, <clears throat> why is it important to eat socks after meditating? It will make up stuff like on the right. It'll say some experts believe that the act of eating a brain to come out of its altered state is a result of meditation, while others suggest that do with fueling the body, blah, blah, blah. Well, it's perfectly fluent prose, which means that if you're a Russian troll farming, you want to disrupt uh, the United States election is a fantastic tool, but it has nothing to do with reality. This is not anchored in the system going and doing a web search to see what experts believe about the act of eating a sock. Nobody's even written about that because it's so ludicrous, but the system has no way of knowing that because there is no cognitive model in the world um, inside of it. Anybody who thinks like we're close to the Star Trek computer when we can't even have a system know that it's kind of a joke to ask about after meditating, um, is, is I think delusional. So it, back to the um, why question, why don't we have it yet? It's 65 years after the famous Dartmouth AI conference. We still haven't solved it. Um, why not? Well, you could imagine what those guys would have said back in the day, Marvin Minsky and people like that. If you said, you know, this is a great thing, but we have a time machine and we know in 65 years, you're still not gonna solve the problem. It would have made excuses as any of Com uh, computers are really expensive. Maybe that's why never got the hardware we wanted in those 65 years, maybe. Or they might've said, well, computers, you know, they don't have enough memory. You're really going to remember a lot of stuff. Or we don't have enough data. There's not enough, you know, we tried, but we couldn't get enough investment in the field. Or we couldn't get enough people. Well, it turns out AI in some ways got everything that Minsky and, and uh, McCarthy and Simon wanted in terms of much cheaper computers with enormous amounts of memory, vast amounts of data, all the money that anybody could possibly imagine, billions and billions of dollars, tons and tons of people interested in, in the field, and that hasn't solved AI. Well, one thing is that AI is harder than its originators realized. I think another thing is that too much research in AI is siloed. There's not enough interdisciplinary collaboration. The, <clears throat> back in the day, people really respected human cognitive psychology when they built AI and they respected linguistics and so forth. And now they're just like, I need my data. I don't need to listen to anybody else. That's not good. 
I think the pendulum has swung too far towards machine learning with too little focus on innate contributions. I think there's still not enough common sense represented in machine interpretable form, except maybe in the proprietary psych database, if there. Um, and we still lack good mechanisms for integrating and acquiring abstract knowledge with machine learning. Those would be my answers for why we're not there yet. So what do we need? Here's kind of a summary of that uh, article that I mentioned. Um, I'll do it quickly so we can get to questions. Um, I think, and it's also, we need rich cognitive models that can keep track of the dynamically changing world. Plastic robot like Elon Musk is threatening um, to build. You need to know like what's in this house, what's their favorite food. What, what do we expect today? You need to constantly update that. You need extensive real world knowledge. What languages do people speak here? Um, you know, what happens when you break a cup? You need to know about relationships. So you need to know that if you see a video of somebody drinking grape juice, that they're going to be less thirsty afterwards. Positionality. So agents have to understand holes in terms of their parts. So I'll skip it simpler. Um, you need to know the difference between a red cube on a blue cube and a blue cube on a red cube. Um, common sense knowledge, I kind of just mentioned, but focusing on uh, time and space and causality, uh, things like physical objects, mental states, interpersonal interactions. We need reasoning. So you need to know that in general, mixtures of, cram of, of two, that if you have a mixture of two things that are non-toxic, it's not gonna cause you to die. Um, and we also need human values. And I haven't talked about this too much, but I think it's a really important area for research. We need to figure out how to program human values and that has to be part of the foundation. We simply shouldn't be shipping things that could recommend suicide to you. Um, towards the people who are on my side of this debate and who like neurosymbolic AI, it's also important to remember that even when we find the best way of integrating, or I think there'll be many best ways of integrating neural in network style approaches with symbolic approaches, we're still gonna need that larger scale knowledge. We're still gonna need the richer cognitive models. And we're also gonna need major advances in engineering uh, methodology. We're gonna need techniques for building robust cognition at scale. We're going to need to know about how we put our new discoveries into real world practice and recognition that intelligence is multifaceted. We shouldn't really be looking for one size fits all solutions at all. So I would say neurosymbolic neuro integration is necessary, but it's not sufficient. It's, it's critical, but it's not a magic bullet. So there's a great article or a sad article, that, depending on your point of view, a striking article in technology. Um, about a year ago saying there were hundreds of efforts to use AI in the um, pandemic and very bore any fruit at all. COVID is a wake up call that we need uh, recommendation engines, advertisement, really try to work towards AI that can make a difference in this world. If we could build a deeper AI that wasn't quote deep learning, which is just a bunch of layers, but was actually deep understanding, we might be able to read, digest, and synthesize uh, fast-growing medical literature. We might be able to um, more quickly figure out how to make better vaccinations. We might be able to build new technologies for addressing climate change. We might be able to power over the risk that human healthcare workers have been taking and so forth. But to get to a deeper AI that can operate in novel environments, we need to work towards building systems with deep understanding. I think the best way to get started on that journey is to focus on hybrid knowledge-driven reasoning based rich cognitive models. And I'll just say, um, I, the news and AI at substack.com uh, if you want my views about the latest uh, overhyped AI. And thank you very much. Thank you, Gary, uh, great talk. And, and, and I think there are many questions already, but, uh, while Katarina is ready for asking her question, I think you, you uh, had a question at the beginning that I think many people want to, to, to know. And is, do you want AGI? And, and do if, I want it? That's a good question. Is, if the answer is yes, why? So I'm actually putting together a podcast now. It'll come out in the spring. It's going to be pretty slick. And one of the, um, it's going to be very carefully structured. And one of the episodes I think is going to be about AI and whether it has had a net positive consequence so far and whether it could have a net positive consequence. And I think on the so far question, it's really a marginal question. So I think that 
Um, what AI did with newsfeed has polarized society consequence on things like vaccine uptake. And so good things. I, I think that Google search is generally good for the world of making information more accessible and that's powered by AI. But what it has done around the misinformation and polarization climate is hugely costly. And there are other costs as well. Um, in terms of future, I think there's a chance that AI could really help in things like agriculture, medicine, and so forth, and that it could, you know, more than carry its weight eventually. Um, however, I, I don't, you know, I don't think we're that close to doing those things in hindsight worthwhile. So I'm not someone, and driving is that there could be payoff, but not yet. Um, I, I think at AGI because of the potential payoffs, but I don't think we're that close to them. And so I think we're actually in some ways at the worst moment in AI history. You know, we used to just talk about it. There was no damage, no harm using it, but it's not very reliable. And so there's a lot of risks now around misinformation, um, prematurely scaling up driving car cars and so forth. So we're at a delicate moment in AI history. I think it is possible to get to a better moment. There's also, you know, what if they try to eat us all? I'm not too worried about that now, but we could. Um, so, you know, the jury is still out. Yeah, so, Katarina, do you want to, to ask your question or I read it? Or well, I could well, just call myself if you like. Yeah, so can you please elaborate, uh, give examples of classical AI being good at abstraction while while poor for learning? Um, I mean, there's just no systematic, taking the second part of that, there's no systematic equivalent to deep learning where you can take an arbitrary problem, feed in your explicit knowledge and extract what you want. So we would like a function essentially that takes the news in Wikipedia and spits out something like the psych database, but maybe modernized for the current era. Um, just don't know how to do that. So there are techniques like inductive logic program with the problems. They, you give them some facts, they might extract like some mathematical generalization from a limited number of facts, but they do well in the real world. Part of the um, rate limiting step there is natural language understanding. These are pretty well if you can actually encapsulate but we don't have a systematic law like do that. And so they end up being toy problems where you, you, you've um, predefined the logical things and then they're, they're less impressive. Um, symbolic knowledge is useful all the time. Right? Like every time we um, do turn by turn directions in navigation, we're using a symbolic AI system. It's doing a pretty good job of taking a massive database and telling you a good efficient way to get from here to there. So like we use these things all the time. They don't get as much press. Google search is mostly still, I think, symbolic AI. It has some deep learning in there, but you know, a large fraction of it is, is written on hand-coded rules. Symbolic AI doesn't even need to be hand-coded, but, but a, a large fraction of, of Google AI is that, which is like the oldest kind of, of AI in some sense. Um, so like symbolic AI is, actually much more present than people really, but no, it has not really solved the learning problem. And so most of symbolic AI is still handcrafted and that tends to limit both how quickly it can be deployed and also how flexible it can be. And so, you know, the other thing people like to do to misrepresent me, this is a symbolic or a GoFi person, good old fashioned AI, and I'm not at all. Like I, I, I'm under no illusions. I, I, I think that stuff has its place um, and I think it can help us to build a next generation, but it certainly doesn't suffice on its own. So Paul Topping asked why deep learning is assumed to be part of a successful AGI solution. I'm actually being a little bit slippery there. Um, I think that something that serves the function of deep learning uh, has to be there, but I don't know if it has to be deep learning itself. So by that, I mean, we need something that can work with large databases and deep learning is the kind of the thing we know now. <clears throat> Um, and detect statistical patterns and so forth. It is, I think, likely that it will be replaced by something that's actually more tractable and more efficient in terms of how much data that is. And so really the right hybrids will be kind of statistical symbolic hybrids. It may not be deep learning per se. Deep learning is the best tool that we have right now. And so if you want to build something right now that is a hybrid, you probably want to use deep learning. 
but it could be in 15, 20, 30 years that people are like, wow, I can't believe how much data they needed in 2020 to solve a basic problem like driving. If they had just had this technique, they could have done it with, you know, a hundredth of the data they were trying to collect or a 10,000th of the data. Um, and deep learning, you know, it was cute, but, and, you know, we're impressed that they did as much what they did with it. But yeah, there was this better way that was this more, much more simple and elegant Bayesian formalism that does the same work. Like, I wouldn't be surprised at all if that happens. So Catherine Hulick asked, uh, who, which groups are integrating symbolic AI? So which groups are working on this, if you know any? There, there's a lot. There's a big group at Intel. There's a big group at IBM that works with Josh Tenenbaum's group, among others. Um, Surat Chaudhuri is doing great stuff on neurosymbolic programming at UT Austin. Uh, Mayor Nike, if I'm saying his name correctly, has a really interesting team at Penn working on a um, neuro called Scallop. Anaman Anankumar is doing some stuff at Caltech. Um, there's lots and lots of people. They don't get the same press, partly because their results tend to be like, we took, we do a little bit better than deep learning. We think this is promising. Rather, oh, we have this toy that you can play with on the internet and it's so much fun. And so they're just not getting the same press. And they're, they're mostly not labs that have the scale to do the kind of um, industrial strength PR that, that Google and Facebook uh, are, and OpenAI are able to do. And so the word is not getting out in the same way, but there's lots of work. You know, if you're in Boston, start with a, a lot of the stuff that Josh Tenenbaum's group is doing at MIT, a lot of which has been increasingly explicitly neurosymbolic. So Evelina Leivada asked, uh, following Sperkle's claims about innateness, do you think it's possible that AI lacks mechanisms for acquiring, acquiring abstract knowledge because this knowledge relies on being equipped with some innate learning mechanisms? The way I think about it is like we need a bootstrapping nucleus. I think a lot about, I, I, I sort of think a ecologized version of what Kant argued in his philosophical book, um, The Critique of Pure Reason. Basically, you need to start with a manifold of time and space in order to get off the ground with the rest of it. And I think that that's right. You need some innate knowledge of time, space, and objects so that you can organize your experience from there. We don't really have the machinery to do this yet, but I presume when I look at babies of all species, humans and others, that they already know there's a world out there and that there are entities there. Different species know different things. Um, and humans are weird because we're kind of born prematurely because the, the big brain doesn't fit through the vaginal canal. And so there's a lot of stuff that happens in the three months, the first three months of life that are actually what I would call neural maturation rather than um, actual learning. But by the time the brain is done, it's basic wiring up, you know, human kids and like say a baby Ibex can do all this stuff, right? A baby Ibex can climb down a mountain. It's astonishing putting this BBC video of it. Up. And that baby Ibex is like, you know, estimating where rocks are and what it can do. It's got a very good innate understanding. It can do this when it's a few hours old, an innate understanding of, of the physical world that is part of how it then organizes other experience. It will tune things and get better. Um, and our, we do a lot of building, building new knowledge, but there's some basis structure, I believe, on which we do that. Um, the irony of my great debates, ongoing debates with Jan LeCun, is this contribution to AI is really an innate prior um, that says that things with spatial appearance will look the same in different locations. This is fundamentally, um, uh, some people would call it like transformational invariance or, or, or spatial invariance or something like that. That's fundamentally what convolution does. That's the thing that LeCun is known for. It's an innate prior. And then he spent you know, he spends a lot of his time arguing against innateness, but the thing that he actually did that people actually use is an innate prior, which makes it the world. We need more things like that. So Ken Church uh, is next, the person to, to ask. And please, Ken, be brief, so because we have many questions. Yeah, um, oh, gee. I, so I was just trying to say that I thought as a matter of debating, it would be maybe more effective to damn the other side with faint praise. You know, like you were saying that um, they're pretty good at some system one stuff. Did, did I not just say that convolution, that wasn't even faint praise. I just damned, damned him with great praise. Convolution okay. is, you know, the, the one of the great contributions to, to modern AI. Let me be clear about that. That is the other yeah. side. Um, but I'm damning them for not doing more of that. Well, just 
Yeah, I think they're, you know, if they just stick to their knitting and say, well, we've accomplished these things and stop the hype on those things. That'd be fine. Yeah. Okay. Well, then maybe say a little more about the good things and then we, then people won't get critical when you hit them with the hard part. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, I did right. just say that. And I also said that AlphaFold was the greatest contribution to AI. So, yeah. Okay. I mean, well, we've had this good. debate before, Ken. There's, there's a bunch of questions and I think I have actually. All right. done okay. Okay. Uh, Misha, you're next. Uh, hi, Gary. Uh, we met at Dave Higgers years yes, ago. Yes, Yeah, th uh, thank you for doing this. I really applaud your direction, and I, I, there's lots to be learned from it. I was wondering whether it's the neurosymbolic or just incorporating principles that would counter the fact that most machine learning is maximizing or optimizing with respect to expected value. So you, you will always have these outliers that you can't deal with. Yeah, I, unless I think, you, you unless you use principles. I, I think that um, that that's a deep question, and that you could probably run it in either direction. It would be useful either way. So the way I think about it is, you can't really encode a lots of a lot of kinds of principles, not all, um, unless you've got some symbolic form, or at least we don't know any good way to do it. Another way to put it is you're absolutely right. And this is where we're foundering is, I mean, let's say I want to put in a principle. So I've got a large language model. I want it to interact with people. And I want to say, don't recommend anything harmful. We have no idea how to put that principle. I'm making a bet that symbolic knowledge gives us some shot. My bet could be wrong. If we could find some other presenting principles such that these systems are constrained, that'd be great. And there are limited how to do that. So that there are some physics problems now where people know how to constrain um, some principles. But when you get to the kind of broader scope of human knowledge, there's lots of you know ordinary everyday stuff. We just don't know how to do a system like this. And that raises the question of whether it's the right kind of system at all. Um, and so your question is very fair. Like there's, there's a lot of state of play there for people to talk about principles. Maybe they got some way to do it that's not symbolic. On the other hand, they have to deal with the fact that there is a lot of symbolic stuff that does describe principles. Humans are able to communicate these things in you know, college classes or whatever, and you'd like to be able to do that. So it's open and fair and interesting, and probably there's room for kind of both perspectives there, and they're, and they're compatible in my view. So great question. Next, trying to, trying to be Walter, swift. Walter Chris Mariano is next. Yeah, Walter? hi. Uh, does AI need a body? Because uh, in my opinion, cognitive AI needs a body with sensors, actuators, and organs. Thank you. Um, I think it would help. I don't know if it's necessary. I think about children with SMA who are confined to a wheelchair, never move around the world and still learn. Blind kids who can still learn a ton about how even we, you, you, what sighted people mean by sight even. Um, if you look at the developmental literature, <coughs> kids really take off when they can start crawling around typically. So I think it's you know, not necessary, but would be really helpful. Um, the, the flip side of that is people have built robots with sensors and try to learn with them, haven't gotten much mileage. I think that's because you need both to have a body would be super helpful and to have a lot of innate knowledge would be super helpful. And it happens to be a sociological fact that most of the people who have built robots with sensors and then do some learning start with almost no prior knowledge and then their systems don't really learn that much because they start with too thin a basis. But I, I don't think that that's, and so like there are no great results from um, the developmental robotics literature is what it's called. There, there's nothing really impressive there, but I don't think that's because developmental robotics couldn't succeed or because it might not um, be useful. I think it's probably not, could be super useful if people would build in a little bit more innate knowledge before they ran their experiments, so to speak. Hey, Katarina, do you want to ask your second question? Thank you, <laughs> invoice. Maybe a strange question, uh, but anyway, uh, if you read uh, Russell's book, <laughs> Human Compatible, what's your opinion on that? Because uh, not uh, the last part of it with predictions of the future, but rather the first part, which is more descriptional of what AI is and isn't, uh, and about optimization and about uh, computation that uh, faster computers will not give us answer. You can uh, compute uh, the wrong answer just faster. So this kind of arguments, yeah. uh, what's your take? I, I, I like the first three quarters of 
a good exposition of what's going on now. I might recommend my own book, Rebooting AI, that came out at the same time for I read it too. You know, I love a it. Slight, slightly different you know, take, but they're, they're actually pretty compatible takes and I like his. Um, I think his specific proposal about inverse reinforcement learning is not the right solution to the AI problem, or at least it's a small part of it. Um, inverse reinforcement learning is basically like you watch a bunch of agents and figure out the rules. And like, you could do that in chess. You can learn the rules of chess by watching other people. It's kind of hard. It's not really the best way to do it. It's kind of clumsy. Um, we as humans, at least when we enculture others, do teach them a lot of explicit values. And I worry that if you do things with inverse reinforcement, it's never going to generalize those things broadly enough. And I would really like to be able to do the explicit thing too. In the end, we probably need to do both. You know, there are probably lots of things. It'd be nice if you could do his in inverse reinforcement learning on, and it'd probably be really nice if you know I could teach you um, things like don't harm other people, and you know your robot would default to that unless you know good reason not to. And Doesn't what's really give that coverage. Sorry, just then follow up with a small question. Uh, then learning by mistakes, because a lot of human learning in school based on first development of, uh, okay, we first do like this, see why, uh, what that's the answer. And now I tell you why the answer is wrong. Yeah. And I put it, it in the context. I mean, there's lots of stuff we do by reinforcement learning. There's lots of stuff we can't. You know, I had a review of um, uh, Common Sense in the ACM with, with Ernie Davis and on the cover, we didn't do this, but there's a great picture of a robot cutting down a tree limb from the wrong side. Um, <coughs> enforcement learning, because people will die. Um, well, robots will die every time <laughs> the robot cuts it down. And if there's anybody below, they'll, they'll get killed. Um, you can't do reinforcement learning on genocide. Like you have to know from first principles that genocide is a bad thing. We don't, we don't you know, want to encourage uh, experimental studies of, of genocide as, as a way to figure out it's immoral. So um, there are some things where reinforcement learning through experience makes sense. And there's some where there are just, there have to be much more efficient solutions than that. We should move on uh, can one question per customer. If, unless we've exhausted them and then follow up. Well, so I think, I, yeah, I think uh, we already over time. Uh, uh, I think we could uh, keep asking questions for a long time. So thank you, Gary, for a, a great talk. And, and My pleasure. And just to tell the people, uh, the first uh, seminar of uh, next year will be by Jan LeCun. So you will hear the other side too of the story. Ah, well, I'll send you some questions to ask him. So, well, you can attend also. Thank you. <laughs> That might be the only way we ever have a public debate. All right. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.